Whoa. What's good, family? This is the Solar Vision Debate League, and this is Solar Mind. We getting into the second half of our double header. We got Mikael in the building along with G-Con. So when you come in the building, hit that like button. Hit the like button when you come in the building. I don't know, man. That last debate, I, I'm pretty sure that was a controversial decision that we, we made. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe so. But, uh, yeah, man. I'll tell you, man. It's about to get real in these playoffs, man. So, uh. Make sure you're coming with your information, bro. And I already know that this joint right here is going to be a classic. G Kai, Mikael, and some Christian stuff in the middle. <laughs> you know what I mean? we about to get all crazy up in here. So make sure you come in the building and catch the debate in its entirety because it matters. Hello? What's up? Uh, it's not. Who are you? Okay. There's no way that this could be. All right. Um, sorry about that. Um, but. We're going to get right into this thing, you know what I'm saying? Because I know it's getting a little late, and we had uh, that last debate kind of lingered a little bit. So um, we're going with the uh, standard format tonight. I mean, no, we're going with a customized format tonight. That will be the five-minute opening. We have a 20-minute premise, a 10-minute rebuttal, and, a, and an interrogation round, another debate where we have the interrogation round. 10 minutes a piece to interrogate for each debater. And then we'll have a five minute closing and then we're going to get into the judging. Um, so let's introduce the debaters. What's going on, Mikael? Hey, Shalom, Shalom, I uh, like to say Shalom, Shalom, grace and peace to all the viewers tonight. Uh, I thank y'all for being here. I'd like to first and foremost give all honor and praise to the Elohim, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, our Mashiach and High Priest. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I'm, I'm grateful for the opponent that I have, uh, Brother G. Khan. And um, I know that this debate is going to be edifying. It's going to be classy. And at the end of the day, um, I think my main goal, and I, I think his is too, <clears throat> win or lose is that the people be edified um, whether they believe it or not I just want them to make sure that at least both of our messages are clear so it will not be any dancing around what I believe and what I know and so uh, you know with that I say uh, peace 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 to brother Mikael what's going on brother G Khan? what's going on what's going on grace and peace all praise to the most high God Grace and peace to the panel, uh, Mikael Ben Israel, Eliyah, also Solomon, and uh, DJ Black. Peace to the family out there. Uh, most high bless. May the most high bless your households. And with that being said, uh, like I say, uh, hopefully it's an edifying, uh, uh, you know, edifying uh, debate. And it's playoff time, baby. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, it is what it is, you know. And uh, like I say, uh, Shout out to Mikael Ben Israel. You know what I'm saying? Always been a uh, pleasure to, uh, you know, either go to war with the brother. You know what I'm saying? Where well, we on the same side. You know what I'm saying? But just as well, you know, we've had our uh, differences as well as getting it in just as well. You know, uh, so with that being said, it's just an honor, you know what I'm saying, to be sitting right here in this spot. I'll praise to the most I got. All right. All right. Shout out to both the baiters. Um, we're going with a Three judge format for tonight's debate. Once again, each judge is worth one PowerPoint and 10 voting points. So let's introduce the judges. What's going on, DJ Black Charles and Judge James? What's up, Yo, man? man? What's going on, man? How you feel? All right. You know, now, Shalom. Yeah. Fellas. Okay, I just want to congratulate uh, both debaters and tell them uh, congratulations uh, thus far. And 
I wish them both well. All right, all right, all right. So let's get right into this thing. Oh, who would like to go first? I, I was supposed to do that off here, but who do you want to go first, brother? Mikhail is on you since you have the home field advantage. <laughs> I'm going to let my brother, uh, I'm going to let my little brother go first. All right. So, uh, g -Con, you're up to bat. We're going to go ahead and get this thing started right now. Uh, let me go ahead and set this timer for your opening, which will be five minutes as what was requested. All right. So, hold on. Make sure I turn this. Uh... <clears throat> All right, so. I had to go upstairs real quick. My wife now, they send up there playing this game downstairs. But hold on, okay, so we got. Let me make sure I set my stuff up real quick. So. <clears throat> All right, so. Uh, my premise is that. As, a, as you see what the debate is, is uh, do what laws do Christians keep, basically? That is the topic of the debate tonight. And uh, I'm going to be showing the laws that Christians keep and uh, also um, that Christians are not lawless. And I'm going to show you, you know, what laws, uh, what, what, what Torah is, which is Torah, which is instructions and teachings. And um, the teachings of the New Testament, so we can uh, show that we're not a lawless people and we're not against law, but we follow what we see as the spirit instructions of the New Testament, which had which has some of the things of the old within the New Testament. And so I'm going to show those things tonight clearly, so without a shout of a doubt, to where people can look and say, you know, these people are not lawless people. Um. Uh, we're not under the law of Moses. There are some things that we see that is in the law of Moses that has come into the New Testament. For instance, it's like if you have a <clears throat> different teachers instructions of a, or of a um, like if you have to detour or something like that. So if a if a person take a detour, they still end up the same route or the same destination. I'm sorry but they may take a, a, a different route. And so we see that the, te the New Testament instructions end you up at a the same destination, but we do see that there are a, diff a different route that was taken on how to go about how to get there because of uh, certain things that happened in the Old Testament. And so tonight, you know, is, is really to show that we've all dealt with contracts. We've all dealt with uh, lease agreements. And so we know that what's involved in those things, which is the terms, penalties, and also conditions. And so we see that when we look at a contract, which is a, 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 a agreement between two or more parties, what, 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 what we should be looking at. And, and, and in some of the things that we're going to see tonight is some of the things that we see that comes from one contract over un, into the next contract. And so, you know, we have to be real clear when we say, you know, what are Christians uh, obligated to do up under the New Testament? And uh, I would uh, hopefully, I, uh, you know, I do know that the brother, you know, he uh, he did with the New Testament. And so what are we are to what are we to uh, uh, expect, you know, what I'm saying of the New Tes Testament, expect of the New Tes Testament. And so, you know. Um, that's my thing to do to, to show those things tonight. You know, um, I'm pretty sure we're going to see things that come out like about dietary laws, uh, things also about the Sabbath and also things concerning um, <coughs> circumcision of that matter just as well. And probably a plethora of the other things that we see that are in the law of Moses. And, and but mainly is to show you guys you know what christians follow what instructions were we given by christ what instructions were we given that was in the epistles 
especially of those who are Gentiles and also who are Christians, uh, who are uh, Jews just as well, uh, not being under the law of Moses. And if they say they are under the law of Moses, then it's just a problem with that, you know? And so, you know, uh, just to show that there is a distinction between the New Testament and the Old Testament and the contrast there that we must look and say that, you know, one, we didn't have access or could not draw nigh, but and, and the veils was up. But through the New Testament, we have that access, seeing that Christ rent the veil and gave us an access with him being the mediator and regenerated our spirit that we may know and understand the things of God and given, give, given the spirit to reveal to us the known mind of God that we may walk in his paths and be led back unto him and also reconcile the world back unto him. And so that is my mission overall. And I'm pretty sure that's Mikael's mission too, just as well. But I think that I can represent that mission uh, better than what he can, you know, um, and I'm going to prove that tonight. And with that being said, I just want to, uh, you know, I can, you know, end it on that one. All right. All right. Thanks a lot, uh, brother g -Con for dropping that science. Your time actually is up. What we're going to do now is we're going to reset this timer for five minutes for the brother. Mikael, whenever you're ready, you can begin, brother. All right. Yeah. Shalom. Shalom, everybody. And uh, i like to say, man, again, it's an honor to be here in these uh, Solar Vision Debate League playoffs because we was cracking right now, baby. Everybody watching. Now, I just like to say, well, my premise is and my stance is um, <clears throat> that uh, basically, if I create an organization and in that organization, I lay down ground rules and the foundation. And let's say um, amongst amongst that um, these ground rules and organizations, I lay down laws that they have to keep. I lay down prayers that they have to recite and I give them practices that they have to perform. And these will be identifying markers to tell whether they are part of my organization. Uh, but if I was to jump into a time machine after I created that organization to, hey, let's say centuries later and the laws are gone, which they are supposed to keep, the prayers are gone and which they're supposed to recite. Although they still keep a couple of practices and call themselves by my organization, there's only two conclusions I can come to. Either they're rogue members and they're lawless, or they are frauds and they are phonies. And so the, the point that I'm gonna make is not only did the apostles who were taught by Jesus Christ himself, even uh, we know that even, you know, Mark and John, without a doubt, wrote, you know what I'm saying, contemporarily with him. Uh, you will see that the apostles and all the first and even second century Christians, all the way up to the fourth century, the second century is when the infiltration came in. It. You will find out that they kept all of these same laws for the most part that the disciples the apostles and christ himself kept even from circumcision even to dietary laws and also keeping the sabbath so what i'm going to prove is yes i'm not saying that the christians are totally lawless but there is a form of lawlessness in your uh these modern day christian churches because they do not, if you put them up next to the early Christians, you literally, they look absolutely nothing alike. And so, like I say, I'm going to prove that either they're frauds, respectfully saying it, or they have most definitely erred in their ways. And so uh, that's my lay down. All right. All right. Let's get right into this thing, man. I want to hear what y'all got to say now since y'all laid down that premise. All right. Let's get it. Uh, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to set this timer for 20 minutes as what was requested. 20 minutes. 
and we're going to hand this thing over to G Khan. Whenever you're ready, you can begin your premise, brother. Oh, so hold on, let me screen share. Hold on. Let me know if you can see my screen. <clears throat> we can see your screen, brother. All right, hold on real quick. Please start the time. Has to give me some water. My throat been bothering me a little bit. But yeah, uh, so <clears throat> you can go ahead and get some ginger ale, brother. Yeah, I'm going to have to. You can go ahead and start it up. Okay, so as the brother stated, uh, <clears throat> there are some things that we see that has taken place in the church, but uh, nevertheless, I'm going to disregard those things. So let's go to um, <clears throat> let's go to uh, hold on. Oh, let's go to Matthew chapter five, right? Now herein is this is Christ, and remember in the Old Testament in the Torah. They did not want the Lord to speak unto them in his voice because his voice was something that was terrible in their ears and it was so strong and so powerful. Somebody need to meet their, meet their mic that he told they told them, speak not unto us in your voice, but speak unto us. But but Moses, you speak unto us. In other words, they said they told the Lord not to speak unto them, but Moses, you speak unto us. And so Moses and the father hearkened unto that. And he said, the prophet, your Lord God will raise up unto you. Him shall ye hear, right? And so once again, here's this prophet in chapter five and one. And he says, look what he says. He says, hold on. he says, and seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain and when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. So we see that these are uh, commandments that we see. And I'm going to go quickly to uh, my day study notes. And I want to show you something here because... When you look at this, it says the New Testament commands, it says there are a thousand and fifty commands in the New Testament for Christians to obey. Due to repetitions, we can classify them under about 800 headings. They cover every phase of man's life in his relationship to God and his fellow men. Now and hereafter, if obeyed, they will bring rich rewards here and forever. If disobeyed, they will bring condemnation and eternal punishment. They are not to be confused, right, with the Ten Commandments, which are abolished with the law of Moses. Note, Acts 15 to 24, right? It says 85 Old Covenant and New Testament contrasts, right? It says they are divided below under their various headings. Now, this is from the Dake study notes, right? And some things I differ from. But I just want to really key in on and emphasize on on these uh, things that it talks about for us what to abstain from. For instance, there are seven things as a Christian that we are to abstain from. Idols that is listed in Acts chapter 15 and 20 when it says, but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. So you have fornication here. You have strang uh, strangled meats, eating blood. That's Acts 15 and 20 just as well. Meats offered to idols. That is Acts 15 and 29. That ye abstain from meats offered to idols and from blood and from things strangled and from fornication from which if ye keep yourselves, ye shall do well, fare ye well, right? And also it says from the appearance of evil. That's First Thessalonians. 5 and 22. Look what it says. It says, abstain from all appearance of evil, right? Fleshly lust. That's 1 Peter 2 and 11. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust 
which war against your soul. Seven things to avoid, troublemakers. That's Romans 16 and 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offense contrary to what are the doctrine which ye have learned. So we see also profane and vain babblings. First Timothy 6 and 20. False science. First Timothy 6 and 20, just as well. Unlearned questions. Second Timothy 2 and 23. Look at my screen, family. Foolish questions, right? Titus 3 and 9. Genealogies that raises questions. Titus 3 and 9. Arguments about the law. Titus 3 and 9. <clears throat> also within these terms and conditions that he's on this mountain speaking about just as well, we can see over here, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So what he's doing is he's putting forth a covenant that will go in place when his blood has been shed. We got to understand that. So he's moving one out and moving the next in. You can look at that in Hebrews, right? Uh, uh, uh. Acts, uh, it says, uh, three acts. Ask and you shall receive. Ask no return of goods. Ask life for backsliders. Two things to awake to. Awake to righteousness. Awake to life. So when one wants to be awake, he needs to awake to righteousness. And that righteousness is Christ. He must put on Christ, right? We also have... Uh, be exceedingly glad, right? Be uh, uh, So these are a plethora of things, as you can see, and I'm not going to go through all of them because there's so many. I stated before, you know, that he has a thousand here and 50 commands in the New Testament alone, whereas uh, the co conventional or uh, in the Old Testament, they will tell you a, a traditional, they will tell you, uh, the third 613, which is uh, a traditional and something that's probably made up, there's probably more than that. But you know, they do say, you know, rabbis say, uh, you know, 613, which there's more than that actually. But the New Testament has more alone. So let's begin to look at uh, some other things. Let's look at um, all right, cool. So, one of the things we want to look at is um the uh dietary law every moving thing that shall be meat for you right this is man's new diet now included in animals right in the old testament right it says and Noah built it well let's 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 go there because we got to talk about the diet thing because this is one of the things that we see that is a law that is not looked at for those who are in the new testament in the, of the new covenant those who are in the new testament we're going to show you that we're not under the strict dietary laws that we see that israel was up under and they are not under it either they're going to say that they is but they're not and i'm going to show you why now when you look at first Timothy 4 3 and 5 look what it says forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God have created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. When did food become not to be sanctified? Right? It's during the law of Moses. But before, prior to, when did God sanctify food or meats to be set, uh, set apart to be eaten? During the time of Genesis, up on the north, Genesis 9 and 3, right? So let's look at Colossians 2 and 16. It says, let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of and, and, and the holy day or of new moon or of the Sabbath days, right? So he said, let no one judge you, right, of what you're eating, what you're drinking, or in respect of any holy day. Or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, 
Romans chapter 14 is a chapter that talks about how the, if you do come in contact with somebody so that you may not offend them, then you are to suffer what you are eating at that time because they may not eat what you're eating. So you shouldn't, you know, uh, offend them in that area. It's telling you how to respect people that, you know, that, you know, where they don't eat a certain thing and you don't get in their presence and eating a certain thing. Uh, rather if you're a vegan, whether if you eat pork or whether if you eat beef or whatever the case may be to where you try to above all make peace. And so uh, when you look at Genesis 8 and 20, right? And um, matter of fact, we will we, we, we get into that at the, uh, what you call, but what we want to get into is the, is what is uh, some more of the things that the Israel is, is under. I mean, that uh, those who are Christians, what they're under. So let's go back to, and look at this 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 list again some more some of the things that we are commanded to do um be reconciled to your brother when you are uh or when you are uh when you have fought with each other be perfect or strive to be perfect be wise as serpents be harmless as doves this is matthew 10 and 6 16 be ready for christ's coming stay attentive stay alert be content with your wages. Be merciful as God is. That's Luke 6 and 36. Be like, uh, be like faithful servants. So these are a plethora of things that we see that a Christian is definitely obligated to do being under the New Testament, right? Be tenderhearted to one another. That's Ephesians 4 and 32. Be steadfast, 1 Corinthians 15 and 58. Be men in understanding, 1 Corinthians 14 and 20. Brother, be not children in understanding, how be it in malice be ye children, but in understanding be men, right? These are instructions for New Testament believers to follow. Be partakers of Christian sufferings. This is 2 Timothy 1 and 8. Look what it says. Be not th thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor, nor of, I mean, nor of me, his prisoner, but be thou partakers of the affliction of the gospel according to the power of God. Be apt to teach. 2 Timothy 2 and 24. Be instant in and out of season. These are commands that we see. And these are also things of 30 be nots. Be not like the hypocrites in prayer. This is Matthew 6 and 5. And when thou prayest, thou should not be as a hypocrite are, for thy love to for they love to pray in the synagogues and in corners of the streets that they may be seen of men. Really, I say unto you, they have their reward. So everything that you see. From the from, from from the things that you should be and the things that you should not be the things what to ask for the things what not to ask for these are the very things that you see that christ is on this mountain teaching them instructing in them giving them torah instructions and teachings this is what this is dealing with be not doubtful in your mind that's luke 12 and 29. So these are a plethora of things. What to believe in. Four things to believe. The gospel. God's existence. On Jesus Christ. God's reward. God rewards diligent, diligent seeking. What not to believe in. Believe not every spirit. But try the spirit. That's first John 4 and 1. Believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. So these are a plethora, a list of things that you can look at that Christians should be following. New Testament laws. And also with things that we see of some of the Old Testament being mixed with the New Testament. Beware of hypocrisy. That is Luke 12 and 1. In the meantime, when they were gathered together in a number of multitude of in, in so much that they trolled one upon another, 
he began to say unto them, unto the disciples, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Beware of dogs and false teachings. That's Philippians 3 and 2. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision. Isaiah 56 to 10. His watchmen are blind. They are all ignorant. They are all dumb dogs. They cannot bark, sleeping, lying down, loving to slumber. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision. Jews are false Jews who are not circumcised in heart. Beware of being spoiled through philosophy. That's Colossians 2 and 8. There is so many things that is in the New Testament that one must uh, adhere to and, and renew his mind daily to the word of God that he may overcome the wiles and tricks of the devil and evil workers. Three things to cast out of your eye or cast away. The beam out of your own eyes. That's Mark, Matthew 7 and 15. What I want to show you is this is after Jesus got through, got done speaking a plethora of all these things and taught his apostles, they went on to write e epistles. But look what he says after he got done on this mouth. It says when he this is, this is Matthew 8 and 1. When he was come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. So he ended his speech. And once he ended his speech. People follow him. Now look what it says in uh, the very chapter before. Let's go down and look what it says. It says in 28, Matthew 7 and 28. And it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings. What sayings? The sayings when he went up on the mount to give them the terms and conditions and penalties of the New Testament. And it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. So these are clear things on, we, on things that we can look in and follow. Now you're going to be told concerning things about uh, observing uh, all of the Mosaic laws, right? And if one is saying that he observes all the Mosaic laws, then he must observe them to where there's not a jot or tittle that is missing, that he must observe them all, every one of them. You're going to hear things about the Sabbath day. But lo and behold, the scriptures is clear in Hosea. Let's get there. Look what it says in Hosea. This is Hosea 2 and 11. It says, I will also cause all her mercies, her feast days, her new moons, and her Sabbaths, and all her solemn feasts. So clearly, if you're in captivity and you say that you're a Jew or if you're in the land he says he's going to cause your feast days your new moons your sabbaths and all your solemn feasts to feast uh, all your solemn uh 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 uh, uh feasts to cease that's clear and if you say that you're under the law and you say that you did you did you did you did, did a person among you who don't keep the Sabbath day? What are you to do to them? You must cut them off. You must kill them. But are you under the law, of Moses? And can you do so? Do you have a government to do so? Is that in the New Testament? And if you don't have that, then. He has made that to cease until we see he starts it up later on. But now it is ceased now.
you can't judge anybody as stated earlier when i stated that let no man therefore judge you in these holy days look what it says sabbaths in all her solemn feasts it is clear here that the sabbaths of israel were to be done away with with a much with much as her mirth feasts new moons and other rituals this is what happened when god made a new covenant not a single commandment was given regarding keeping up any particular day as a sabbath it was plainly set forth in the new testament that every man may do as he pleases regarding a sabbath day that is romans 5 and 6. it says one man esteeming one day above another another esteeming every day alike let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind all right all right thanks a lot brother what we're going to do now is we're going to reset this timer and we're going to hand this thing over now to brother brother mikhail brother mikhail you have 20 minutes to do your thing brother whenever you're ready i right, miss your mic brother okay yeah shalom shalom all right i hope everybody can hear me clear i don't know how that screen share thing gonna work out so I want y'all to just follow me. Now, that was a beautiful opening because it actually just goes right into what I want to go in. I like to say, first off, a lot of that on that information that he pulled up from somebody, he mentioned them earlier, who that person was that had that package put together. He said it was about a thousand of them. He couldn't read it all. So of course he didn't do it himself. I got all mine wrote out myself. I did it, but I actually agree with the person that he got that from to a, a certain degree. The whole problem is, do Christians today follow any of that? When is the last time y'all keep it real? Y'all heard a preacher get up there and say, yeah, we shouldn't be eating the blood and we shouldn't be doing this and that. And then it was really funny when on the, uh, the information that he was reading, he said that the law of Moses, which is abolished. And he said that that was the 10 commandments. He literally said that. He said that the Ten Commandments was the law of Moses that was abolished. And then he turned around after that and said, well, I don't agree with everything in here. So we know, you know, he don't agree with the person that he getting the information from. So he goes on to read. And then he just read Hosea chapter two, which is funny, because if you know when it's talking about uh, Judah and Israel and it talks about the split in Hosea chapter three, verse four, it lets you know that they literally went for a long time without the feast, without the Sabbath and all that, because Israel uh, fired the Levites and they went to Judah. They went back and forth like three times. So that's a historical thing, but we'll just keep it going. So like I said, I'm going to lay out my facts about this and say that although I agree with a lot of the things that was on that list, I say we have to go further. And so one of the things you'll know is the reason that your average the modern day uh, uh, organized churches are so far off on the law is because for one, they have a problem with the term law. They don't understand it being that such a vast majority of the New Testament was written by Paul. So if you go to Matthew, the fifth chapter, verse 17, uh, and what, which, what my brother pulled up, I'll go there right now. So let's go to Matthew chapter five. And I'll pick it up. Let me see. Matthew 5 and 17. And this is what it says. Matthew 5 and 17. It says, uh, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till the earth be fulfilled. Now, what's funny about that in his opening statement, he literally said that that was talking about the law of Moses, the Ten Commandments. Well, we know, according to this, out of any laws that you pick, if you want to say 613, those are the ones that he definitely didn't do away with was the Ten. And then, of course, he went against the Sabbath day, which is going to definitely be a problem for him if you're saying that uh, modern day Christians shouldn't follow that. And we know that the first and second century Christians literally followed that. And I think they would know better than we would. So also, <clears throat> if you look at Matthew chapter 27, verse 50 
through 51, you will see that that is when the veil of the temple ripped. And of course, that was the symbolism that the sacrifices were in. So we know that it's certain things, you know what I'm saying, that is not tied up, that is not tied up with like the Ten Commandments and certain other laws that still stand in play. So that's kind of like a funny, funny uh, play on words or whatever. Also, if you look, and um, if you look in uh, Psalms chapter 22, verse 16 through 19, it tells us that is, you know, the prophecy that uh, Jesus with his hands and arms being pierced. And of course, uh, Daniel chapter 9, 24, 26 through 27, it tells you that Christ got cut off in the middle of the week, which was a Wednesday, right? I want y'all to listen to this, all the Christians, because this is where the problems come in at. You know what I'm saying? He was cut off on the Passover and the next day was a Sabbath. But it lets you know that it was a high day. You see what I'm saying? So that next day after that would have been the first day of Feast of Unleavened Bread. So my question is, how is it that Jesus Christ kept all the, the, the customs from the Old Testament, right? His apostles kept these, 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 these same um, traditions and customs. But then all of a sudden something happens. And then it's like, no, you don't really got to keep the 10. You can keep like seven. You know what I'm saying? Uh, no, you don't really have to keep the dietary law, but just only restrain from blood. Where it's funny because you get the restraint from blood literally from the law of what he would say, Moses. You know what I'm saying? If you want to say that, so being that it's in the first five books, or you could just say he got it from the law outside of that, which is something that he just argued argued against. Another thing that I would like to bring up, I would like to bring up is the terminology of law. And like I say, this all comes from Paul's usage of the word law. I want to show you an example that this is what get your modern day Christian in trouble. I want to go to 1 Corinthians. I want y'all to follow me now. I want to go to 1 Corinthians, the 14th chapter. So this 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And when I get there, I want to read something to you real quick. This 1 Corinthians 14 and 21, it says, In the law it is written, with men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people. And yet for all that will they not hear me, saith the Lord. Now Paul said it was written in the law. You know what I'm saying? With men of other tongues and other lips will I speak to this people. We know that the law is the Torah or the first five books of Moses. But hold on now, he didn't get that out the first five books of Moses. Do you know where he got that from? Let's see, Isaiah chapter 28. See, and what I'm proving right now is the reason that your modern day Christians don't know what laws to keep is because they don't even know what law means when they reading um, mainly Paul's letter. And this is what Peter warned you about in um, 2 Peter, chapter 3 verse 15 so if you go to isaiah chapter 28 and verse 11 we're gonna see this right here isaiah 28 and verse 11 it says for with a stammering lips and another tongue will i speak to this people oh i'm gonna show it again just to show you that they absolutely do not understand what law is therefore they picking and choosing which laws they want they they want to keep if I go and show you that there is a law that we don't keep, I'll tell you why we don't keep that law, and I'll be able to point it out, God willing. But with them, you only got two ways to choose. Either it was already written, because that's all they had was the New Testament, or they're actually creating which laws they're comfortable with keeping and which laws they're not comfortable with keeping. So I'm going to go here again. Let's go to John chapter 10. Let's see what Christ said. Let's see what Christ said. This is the confusion. They even have problems with, uh, you know, with certain things that Christ say, because what they don't understand is amongst the Israelites, terminologies like the law would just refer to the Old Testament sometimes and not necessarily uh, a specific law as if it's uh, broke down. So you have to actually know how to contextualize it when one is speaking. So John chapter 10, verse 34. It says, Jesus answered them, is it not written in your law? I said, ye are gods. Is it not written in your law? Now, hold on. They'll keep on telling you, well, the law is the law of Moses. 
or the loss of 613, the 613 laws. But let's see where he got that from. Psalms chapter 82. This is a song, and this is the problem. This is exactly why, people, this is exactly why Peter said, our brother Paul got wisdom, but he not for rookies, because it will destroy them. And that is why your modern-day churches, so-called Christians, are destroyed for the most part. Psalms chapter 82. Here we go. And it reads, verse 5. They know not, neither will they understand. They walk in darkness, and the foundations of the earth are out of course. I have said, ye are gods, and all of you children are, are, are uh, and all of you are children of the most high. But ye shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. Is that the law, y'all? So now that literally eliminates somebody always running to Paul. You can even see they don't know what Christ's talking about sometimes and saying, see, look. He said the law was bad. My man G. Con brought up Romans chapter 14, verse 14. Oh, if Romans chapter 14, verse 14 is saying that um, basically you can eat whatever and it don't make you clean, that literally contradicts Ephesians chapter 5, verse 5, written by the same man. Now, we know Paul wasn't schizophrenic, so that only leaves one option. That means my mans don't know what Romans 14 plus uh, uh, chapter 14 and verse 14 means. And I'm going to show you. So let me go to, uh, matter of fact, I'll go there since he kicked it off. Let's go to Romans chapter 14 and let's check out what he, uh, what he quoted. So let's see. Romans chapter 14, verse 14. Here we go. And so, yeah, people, this, this, this definitely something that needs to go out. For people to be able to deal with because it's the same stuff regurgitated over and over and that is never challenged in the right way if you ask me so here's Ro romans chapter 14 verse 14 it says i know and, and, and am persuaded by the lord jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself but to him that is esteemed anything to be unclean to him it is unclean see this is why peter told you that now we don't have a problem right here because either this is saying that paul then lost his mind or that mean a person don't know when he's talking about law what laws he's talking about ephesians chapter 5 and i'm gonna go to uh verse 5 of the light uh ephesians 5 and 5 it says for this ye know that no whoremonger nor unclean person wait a minute i thought there was nothing unclean but it tell you in the law of Leviticus chapter 11, if you eat unclean food, you're unclean. So hold on, now we got a problem. Nor covered this man who is an idolater, uh-oh, that's in the Ten Commandments too, although he did hide that on his, list, on his list, has inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. So now this same Paul just said that if you're an unclean person, what makes you unclean? We know he's not talking about a woman's menstrual. I ain't never heard no way if a woman die on her menstrual and she go up, she can't get into the kingdom. You see what I'm saying? So we know it's talking about there's still something that can make you unclean. And we know one of the main things that make you unclean is eating pork or eating unclean food. If you don't believe me, let's go to Acts the 10th chapter. See, and this was another student of Christ himself. So I'm going to go with the students, the early Christians, and not with this new stuff we see. Because when you line them up, somebody don't know what they're talking about. And so that's what I want to see. So I'm going to go to, um, let me see. Uh, I'm going to go to Acts chapter 11. And I'm going to pick it up. And let me see. Okay, I'll pick it up at verse 8. But I said, not, not so, Lord. This is after he showed Peter the vision of the thing that was clean and unclean. It said, but I say, not so, Lord, for nothing common or unclean have at any time entered into my mouth. This is the, the Christian who had the keys to the church, man. This is what they like to say is the father of it, who built the church himself. He did not eat anything common or unclean, the dietary law. And I know he's going to try to get into, well, you got to kill it a certain way, or you got to do this, you got to do that. It already told us in the book and the prophecy we we'll eat, we'll eat the foul bread amongst the Gentiles. So is that a contradiction? No, that's telling you. 
They're going to go every way out of their way to try to pollute you to make you unclean. It's up to you to try your best. You don't just be lazy and throw your hands up. And I'm going to show you what Paul saw it say about that too. But let me continue reading. It says, um, but I say not so, Lord, for nothing common or unclean have at any time entered into my mouth. Hey, so you mean telling one man was hanging around Jesus? He ain't out none of them days say, hey, man, you know you can eat a pork chop now if you want to. Come on, man. They making this stuff up. But the voice answered to me from heaven and said, what God have cleansed, thou shalt not call common. And it was done three times. Now, this is what they like to go to. They'll read that one part say, see, look, God cleansed it. But all you got to do is go right to the bottom. And when he went to Cornelius, he said, Cornelius said to him, well, you know, it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to come into, uh, upon a person that is a Gentile. And he turned around and said, no, God has showed me, call no man common or unclean. So this vision wasn't even about a dietary law. Peter thought it was about a dietary law because he saw the unclean beast and the clean beast. Those beasts represent nations. They always did. You should know that, g -Con, from studying the book of Daniel so much. And it talk about the beast and the faux beast, which represent nations. We got to get off milk, man, and we got to get on his meat. I can literally concede this little time into, uh, you know, how much time I got left? Solar. Solar mine. Well, I'll just keep going because ain't no telling what solar mine didn't win. So let me keep on talking. All right, let me go to Acts chapter 18. Let's check this out. Let's see, this is the point I'm trying to bring out. When you read in this book, all they had was the Old Testament, y'all. Y'all feel me? All they had was the Old Testament. So either you going off the laws that they already got wrote down and they know, or basically you making them up as you go because they might fit your comfortability level. So I'm going to go to Acts, uh, Acts 18, and I'm going to pick it up at verse 13. And it says, saying this fellow persuaded men to worship God contrary to the law. And when Paul was now about to open his mouth, Yalio said unto the Jews, if it were a matter of wrong or wicked lewdness, O ye Jews, <clears throat> reason would that I should bear with you. But if it be a question of words and names and of your law, look ye to it, for I would be no judge of such matters. Now, this is what's funny right here. The people was trying to accuse Paul of the same thing these modern day Christians is teaching people you don't have to keep laws. This is what they was accusing him of. But homeboy told him, hey, look, man, because the Lord tell you earlier in here that he was going to put, you know, basically he had people there that, that was going to look out for him. He said, man, look, if it was about you out here acting crazy, I will intercede. But if it got something to do with y'all law, I ain't got nothing to do with it. So it's funny that the same thing Paul was being accused of back then they built whole religions off of it, falsified it, polluted it, and now they're trying to bring it back to the people. But I'm going to keep on going because I think my brother uh, <clears throat> Solar might be uh, having a toilet break or something. Now, what he got going on over there, fam? So let's look at this. Romans no, chapter not. You got uh, 20 minutes, brother. It's four minutes and 13 seconds left, bro. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I forgot it was 20 minutes. Romans chapter 7. So let's check out Romans chapter 7. We about to have fun with this. Because these are the same things y'all hear every time when somebody want to, like, slither their way up off of it. And again, I'm not talking about my bro, but he representing them right now, so we got to deal with it. So let's go to Romans chapter 7, and let's look at verse 7. Let's see what he said about the law. Okay, and now we know to contextualize which laws he's talking about. Romans 7, <clears throat> I mean, Romans, uh, here we go, verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? When he was reading that earlier, it, it literally basically said, if you're around here pushing the law, you basically, basically wicked. God forbid, nay, I had not known sin, but better law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. Oops. Oh, man. Ain't that, the, ain't that in the Ten Commandments? Why do, these Ten, why do this royal law that that cheat that he read off of 
literally said, or for what he said, was the law of Moses, which was the Ten Commandments, which was abolished. So That's that was he, Romans 7 and 7? That was Romans 7 and 7, bro. Oh, and there's more. Let's keep reading. Verse 8. But sin taken occasion by the commandment wrought in me all manner of conceptuous. For without the law, sin was dead. You ask yourself, what does he mean by that? Well, let's see. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment, which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin taken occasion by the commandment deceived me and by it slew me. And that's the problem. These people running around saying, Christ, Christ, Jesus, Jesus, we are Christians. There ain't no law have been deceived by sin. This is what he tells like, well, let's, let's just look at this. Because he only understood the letter at one time. Christ is getting him to understand the spirit behind it, not get rid of it. It says, wherefore the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. Oh my God. This is Paul. Why they never read this? They run to the ones that they don't understand and they try to make Paul look like a madman. So again, my stance is when we look into history, which I'm going to read off on my next time, we're going to read those earliest ones who were taught closer by the timeline of the apostles. And we're going to see, did they keep the Sabbath day? Think about it now. They were already pushed out of Jerusalem in 70 AD. You see what I'm saying? We're going to see, did they get circumcised? And we're going to see, did they keep a so-called quote unquote kosher diet? That will show you who the real Christians was. And by the way, they were founded by Israelites, the real original Christians, Messianics, whatever you want to call them, were founded by Israelites. So if it is not an Israelite foundation on it, if you can't see nothing that even resemble an Israelite in it, it ain't from God and it definitely ain't a Christian. It's paganism. I can see you. All right, all right. Shout out to Brother Mikael. Just got back from my toilet break, and I'm about to get into this next round. <laughs> uh, let's set this time of four. What we got? The rebuttal, 10 minutes. Set this time up for 10 minutes, and we're going to hand this thing over to Brother right. g -Con. Brother g -Con. You have 10 minutes for your rebuttal whenever you're ready to begin. All right, cool. So if you can clearly see, um, it says that in Acts 15 and 3, right? It says, And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved, right? It says, Now when therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small decision and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. Now, here's the thing. It says be circumcised after the manner of Moses. But check this out and look at the 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 um what took place with this. Now, when you look at it, it says um, this is uh um this is this is Acts, right? At the beginning. Now look what it says. It says, oh, why is this thing not moving? Let's go up a little bit more. Oh my God. I ain't All right, so it says, it says right here, it says that. I heard this right here. This is verse five. But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and command them to keep the law of Moses. Let's look at the turnout of this, because one of the things that he's going to talk about, he's going to talk about, as I stated before, the Sabbath days, which I showed you that if a person is supposed to keep the Sabbath day, then I mean, if a person don't keep the Sabbath day, then they shall be stoned. Does Mikael have the right to stone me? Can he throw a stone at me? For the scriptures is clearly stated in Moses. It says that not one jot or tittle shall fell from the law. 
Deuteronomy 27 and 26 says that you must do all that is contained in the law, the book of the law to do them. You must do all of them. So does Mikael has a stone to throw at someone that is a Christian that is not keeping the law? He just read to you, according to the dietary law previously, that it says that you will eat your defiled bread among the Gentiles. Do you know that Mikael does not raise his own food or he does not keep kosher so his bread is defiled? He gets his groceries just like everybody else from the groceries that we see that's at the markets that are heathen markets. Do you know that he is not keeping the dietary law, nor is he keeping the Sabbath at all? But he will tell you that he would. Do Mikael keep the judgments of the law of Moses? He possibly couldn't because he doesn't have a government nor civil laws to judge me or do any of those things. This is why it says, let no man judge any man according to new moon, Sabbath days, or none of those things. You have no judgment nor no civil gov government to judge anybody, first off. And also it says that a Christian or a believer should not be a hypocrite. So why are you being a hypocrite, Mikael ben Israel? If you want to sit in the seat of Moses, then you must be judged by Moses for not doing the entirety of the law. Now, let's talk about that being defiled that you talked about. Let's get into that and see what that's talking about. Now, let's look at what Christ says here. Look at what he says in This is nothing that enters into a man can defile a man. Let's go to that scripture. All right, that is Mark 7 and 15. Let's go to Matthew 15, matter of fact. Matthew 15. And let's go to 11. Look what it says. It says, now they're complaining about him with washing hands. Christ gets on the subject of what a man eat and how meats is purged. He wasn't, they wasn't even talking about that. He, he got on the subject and look what he says. Now that which, he says, not that which go up into the mouth of a man to follow for man, but that which come up out of the mouth, this to follow for man. It says that then came his disciples. Well, matter of fact, before we do that, Mark 7 and 15 is a better translation of that. Well, not translation, but uh, it tells the entire, entirety of the story. The Mark 7 and 15. So look what he says. He says, there is nothing from without a man that enter into him that can defile him, but the things which come out of him, those are they that defile the man. Now, what comes out of a man that defiles, that defiles the man? He says it right down below. He says, if any man have ears to hear, let him hear. Mikael definitely doesn't have ears to hear because he didn't hear this. Look what it says. Are ye so without understanding, Mikael? Do you not perceive that whatsoever things from without entered into the man, it cannot defile him? So what God is talking about is something that is defiling the man is the things that come out of the heart. Look at verse 19. Because it is it, it entered not into his heart but into the belly and go out into the drought, purging all meats. So he's talking about things that we see that deals with the dietary laws, right? Or things that you eat in general that, that causes one to be defiled. So, but look what he says that defiles him. He says, he, I mean, he says, that, he says that, that, that they say it causes one to be defiled, right? He says that these things causes one to be defiled and they do under the Old Testament laws, right? But look what he says that really that the truth of the matter that makes one to be defiled in spirit. Look what it says. Because it, it, it says that that which cometh out of the man, that defile of the man from within, out of the heart of the man proceed of evil thoughts. So what is he saying? He's saying, that, listen, whatever enters into you, that does not defile you, right? He says it purges. He said it goes through the drought and purges all meats. He said, that which comes out of the man, that defile of him. Well, what comes out of the man? From within, out, or, or from, he says, for from within, out of the heart of men, proceed of evil thoughts, adultery, fornication, and murderers, thefts, covetous, wickedness, deceit, deceivages, 
evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. Now, this is Christ is saying this, and this is the New Testament instructions that he's telling you. It's not about what you eat. The kingdom of God is not eat meat or drink. It's what comes out of you that defiles you. That is that what comes out of the heart that defiles you. That causes you to be defiled. So this is what Paul is talking about that defiles a man. And this is why when you go back to Acts, look at the conclusion of the matter over in Acts 15. Look what it says. It says, it says, for as much as we heard, a certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your soul, saying, ye must be circumcised and keep the law of Moses, to whom we gave no such commandment. They wasn't given a commandment to do those things. It seemed good unto us being assembled with one accord to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul. Right? It says, 29. That ye abstain from meats offered unto idols. I mentioned that in my opening, and from blood, and from things strangled, and from fornication. I mentioned that in my opening, from which if ye keep you, yourselves, ye shall do well. Right? This is the law to the Gentiles that we see. So to say that the Gentiles or those that are Christians are obligated to keep things, you don't know what you're talking about. Now, as in regards to when we start talking about the Sabbath day. It says uh, in, 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 in Mark, he says, he says over in Mark, he says, look what he says. This is, uh, um, this is, well, he says over Colossians, I'm sorry. Look what it says. Well, not in Colossians, yeah, Galatians. I'm sorry, Galatians. But now after ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how then ye turn again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage. Ye observe days and months and times and years. This is Paul talking to them in regards of things that was foreshadows, things that have passed, and now we ought to deal with the things that are the reality, not on foreshadows, but to grasp the reality of what these things mean. And so to sit back and say that a, a person is obligated uh, to keep this Sabbath when he says he will make your holy days to cease and your Sabbaths to cease. You're not even keeping those. Who can you actually, who can you actually st uh, uh, stone if they don't keep it? None of those things. One jot of tittle should not fail from the law, you said, right? And you then you go and you say the sacrifices was taken away. Well, that's your jot and your tittle then. That means you're not even following the judgments of the law. That was taken away. <laughs> Okay, time, time, time. All right, we're going to now hand this thing over to Brother Mikael. You also have 10 minutes for your rebuttal. Whenever you're ready, you can begin, brother. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, thank you so much, my beloved brother. You definitely uh, started this, this nice fight, though. I like it, but you're starting to make it a little bit easier for me. So let me keep track of everything he said. He made a statement uh, where he just said, well, why I'm not stoning anybody? And, you know, he went on to say that. So let's go back to the exact same book that he was reading not too long ago. He didn't go to the chapter. We know first off, one of them, we know an example was when the, the people came to Jesus Christ when they uh, uh, accused the woman of committing adultery. But guess what? They didn't follow the law the way the law say to do. Were well, you supposed to judge somebody? Where was the other person that committed adultery? Both of them supposed to be stoned together. So we are not righteous judges. That's why we cannot kill nobody. Second, we couldn't do it because we've been kicked out the land. Oh, I forget. He don't like to associate Israelites with Jesus Christ. They don't like to associate Israelites with the church. They don't like to associate Israelites with Christian. But the truth of the matter is we are the foundation and the teachers of it. So, no, you couldn't judge. But let's look at it. Let's go to Romans, the cha uh, Romans chapter 13. So let's look at Romans chapter 13. And matter of fact, I'm going to pick it up in verse 9. It said, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God, and the powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the powers, resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist 
shall them receive damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good. Thou shalt have praise in the same. Let me ask y'all a question. If I go out there and catch somebody doing some bogus work on a Sabbath day and bust him upside the head with a brick, is that not considered evil under this government that he sent us to for being unrighteous judges? Yes, it is. He just told us if we go against that law, you see what I'm saying? That we're actually going against God. So he cut himself. Let's keep going. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of good and the revenger of them that execute wrath against them that doeth evil. So the Most High is going to do that judging for us. All those little things, he's going to do that because when we had a chance to do it, we messed up and we got ourselves kicked out the land. This ain't that hard, man. I'll just keep on reading. Let me go to verse 8. Oh, no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth one another have fulfilled the law. For this thou shall not commit adultery, thou shall not kill, thou shall not steal, thou shall not bear false witness, thou shall not covet, and, there's, and there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in saying, namely, thou shall love thy neighbor as thyself. Did you notice at the end of that? He said, if there be any other commandment. But hold on. I thought we only had to keep six or sometimes seven. Why is it that he said that? Because you know dang on well, he not finna only name the 10, but then sit up and name about 600 something more of them. Come on, man. That's people not thinking logically. So he's saying that you know if it's something not the mother laws or commandments that you're supposed to keep, you do it by loving your neighbor. Why? If I love my neighbor, I will not commit adultery on him. I will not cover his wife. I will not lie to him. I will not uh, steal from him. This is real simple, man. So let me keep it going. He also said, oh, he said so much stuff. Oh, okay. Here go another one. He brought up uh, Matthew. We was talking about that. I knew he was going to go there too. Matthew 15. Oh, boy. About the washing of the hand. So let's go look at this. Now, mind you people, these were Israelites. And we know that Jesus could not break a law or that would make him literally not the Messiah. That would make him literally uh, 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 not a lamb without blemish if he broke any of these laws. And on top of that, what makes it worse, according to what our brother G-Con just said, not only uh, uh, is he promoting it, but he told it. But I thought Jesus just said, oh, hold up. I'm going to go ahead and read it for you. Matthew chapter 15. Oh, boy. Here we go. So let's see, Matthew 15, my apologies, that was Mark. I was looking at when he went there. So let's look at Matthew chapter 15. Bear with me, y'all. I'm old school. I like to flick the books. I don't trust them computers like that. Matthew chapter 15, it's saying, uh, why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders for they wash not their hands when they eat bread? Mind you, the subject ain't about pork. The subject ain't about unclean fish because none of them there was crazy enough to be eaten. And you know Jesus wasn't going to promote it because he was the master of the law. So watch this. But he answered and said unto them, why do you also transgress the commandment of God by your traditions? He's talking about the traditions. Here we go. For God commanded saying, honor thy father and thy mother. That's in the Ten Commandments again. And he that curses his father or his mother, let him die the death. You could find that in Deuteronomy and Leviticus. You curse your mama or daddy, you were supposed to be stoned to death. Oh, wow, Jesus went outside the Ten Commandments. Watch this, right? But ye say, whosoever shall say to his father his mother is a gift by whatsoever he might as prophet. Now let's scoot down some, and let's look at this. He called them. He said, uh, ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy unto you, saying this people draw near to me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. So these people always talking about God, God, Christ, Christ, I love your faith. Oh, liberty, all that type of stuff. But they don't do nothing, he said, do that was written down. It say, but in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. You got to ask yourself, how many Christians is it on this planet? Last time I checked, if you include them in the Catholic Church, it's over 2 billion of them. 
Didn't it tell us many was going to come in Christ's name and deceive many? And then the, the thing he put up was, it was real honorable. It said idolatry was bad. It said it more than one time. But every last one of those churches, for the most part, are into idolatry. They celebrate Christmas. They celebrate Easter. You go in there, they got a big crucifix up there. You see what I'm saying? With big bogus uh, uh, portraits of a gay seizure boy jail. So this is crazy. But let's scoop down. Let's see if this is talking anything about a dietary law. So let's look. Verse 16. Are ye also without understanding? Do not ye understand that whatsoever enter at the mouth go off into the belly and is cast out into draw? Now, he tried to be slick and said, look, Jesus switched it up about the dietary law. No, he didn't. Everybody know that the Pharisees had a thing with the custom with the washes, but they did not like germs, man. And what's funny, they was eating bread with dirty hands. So they looking like, man, you eating that defiling the bread. Where do the bread go? The same place the meat go, in your belly. So they think you're defiled because you're eating dirty. You're an unclean person eating and it's become dirty. What he going to tell them? Let's see. But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murderers, adulterers, uh, adulterers, nurses, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands defile not a man. See how he tried to slide by that? He tried to make it seem, that's why he said, no, let's go to Mark because it's a, a, a better translation. No, he said it quite clear right here. He was talking about eating with unwashed hands. He tried to make you uh, say, make you think that he was saying, oh, uh, you know, eating a pork chop or eating a rat ankle, uh, that don't defile you. No, that ain't what he said, man. Let's stop playing. And as a matter of fact, so let's go look. Let's go look and see what it says. Let's go to Matthew, the 15th chapter. We gonna, I mean, the fifth chapter. Let's bag up. Matthew 5. This is what he just literally accused Christ of doing. Matthew 5 and 19. Listen to this, y'all. This is amazing. Matthew 5 and 19. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments, maybe he was talking about that John Tittle earlier, and shall teach men so. Now, hold on. Didn't he just say Christ was teaching us that we could break Leviticus 11, the dietary law, when we clearly seen it was talking about dirt on your food? He is, he is saying the man broke his own law and shall teach men to do so. He shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So according to the logic g just tried to lay out there, Christ going to be considered the least in the kingdom of heaven. God forbid. Let's continue on with it. Now, man, this, whoo, you can turn it up some, little brother. This is what I like, though. This is what I like. So let's look at something. He says, uh, John chapter 7. Let's see if this Moses thing is so bad because it keeps being brought up. Like I say, I already proved earlier, they don't be knowing how to contextualize this. You know what I'm saying? So let's look at it. John chapter 7 and verse 23. Let's check something out real quick. So this John chapter 7 verse 23. And this is what it says. I started 22. Moses therefore gave unto you circumcision, not because it is of Moses, but of the Father. All right, repeat that last verse that you uh, just split right there, brother. Okay, it said, Moses therefore gave unto you circumcision. Not, not because it is of Moses, but of the Father. All so right, what, the Father. What's the Bible verse, brother? Oh, that is, uh, that is Matthew, the fifth chapter in the 22nd verse. Okay, thanks a lot. Chapter All right, I got you, brother. So what we're going to do now is we're going to get into this rapid fire round. And we're going to start out with the interrogation. Since Brother Mikhail, um allow G kind of go first, we're going to let him um, lead on the interrogation. The time is set for 10 minutes. Whenever you're ready, you can begin your interrogation. Brother Mikhail. Okay, give me okay. one second. Give me one second. Um, <clears throat> okay. Okay, uh, Brother G Con. Yes, sir. All right. Um, <clears throat> let me ask you a question. Um, 
So according to Ephesians, could, could you go to Ephesians chapter five real quick for me? Ephesians 5, go ahead. And what? Okay. okay, Ephesians chapter 5. Hold on, let me get that real quick. I was pouring me some water. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians 5. Oh, all right, Ephesians 5. And I'm going to pick it up at uh, verse 2. Let me read this and I wanna, I'm want i going to ask you uh, what, does, what does this mean? It says, uh, walk in love as Christ also have loved us and have given himself for us as an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smell of Savior. Me and you agree on it. But fornication and all uncleanliness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become saints. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know that no whoremonger or unclean person, nor covenant man who is an idolater, have any inheritance in the kingdom of God. So, uh, oh, and I got to add this part. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God. So we know it's people tricking people out of stuff. So my question is, he says in here twice, don't be an unclean person, don't be unclean. Now, can you tell me what uh, is the criteria for unclean that he's talking about well it has to be uh unclean when it comes to unclean um spiritually because as you read in that scripture you went to um uh, matthew right and i went to mark and when you see in that scripture mark 17 and 15 you stated that it wasn't talking about the uh uh, uh um it wasn't talking about food, foods that but it actually is it says there's nothing from without the man that entered into him that can defile him but that things which come out of him those are they that defile the man but it says that the food is purged uh that we see that goes into a man and that is not what defiles him so I'm pretty sure we've seen it, you know, it wasn't talking just about, because it says in, in, in 19, because it entered not into his heart, but into the belly and go out into the drought, purging all meats. So he's talking about all meats, all of these things. So he's saying these are the things that does not defile a man, but a man is defiled spiritually. So this is the way he's defiled. Thefts, covetous, thoughts, fornications, murderers uh evil thoughts uh blasphemy pride foolishness this is what the defilement that he's talking about here and that defiles a man spiritually and that's why he's giving spiritually uh things when we look in matthew objects as well okay <clears throat> well if you're saying that that's just talking about meats as far as dietary law well we know that they were looking at let's let's th let, let's look at this the conversation was about dirty hands. It wasn't about dietary law. And so when you touch meat, the meat would be defiled in their eyes or dirty. So why would he bring up a dietary law when that wasn't even the subject? And as I showed earlier, like you said, according to, if what you're saying is true, and Matthew, the fifth chapter, that would mean he taught them to go against the dietary law. Am I right? No, he didn't teach them to go to against the dietary law because they was under the dietary law. He taught them what actually defiles a man. That's what he taught them. He said the defilement of him of a man is really spiritual. If anything, just like you'll say in Matthew chapter five, there is no such laws to judge a man if he's looking on a woman. There is no such laws as those. Is it? Can you judge a man for looking at a woman? No, he took that to a spiritual level, a spiritual. Okay, so why, why is this not on a spiritual level then? Because it's not. If you read it in context, it's clear as day. All right, well, go ahead. Okay, okay, okay. Well, yeah, and just, just to go along with it, uh, we're going to go to Second Corinthians 6. So uh, can we go to Second Corinthians 6? Because you say... Right, Second Corinthians and Yeah, it. Second Corinthians, the sixth chapter. And because okay. uh, you're saying that that's, that's basically just talking about spiritually. But let's look at this. So Second Corinthians 6 and uh, 17. It say, wherefore come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. What what is that? What is he talking about? Well, this couldn't be talking about once again, 
as we say, you see in uh, Second uh, Corinthians about something that is defiled, uh, uh, with, with, with basically, um, with the with something that is defiled, uh, uh, ceremonially. Because look what it says up above it says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what have fellowship what for what for what have what fellowship have un, the righteous with unrighteous and with the communion have light with darkness and what uh conquered have christ with Baal? it says and so and so when you look at this text it says and what agreement have the temple of god with idols for ye are the temple of the living god and god have said i will dwell in them so what this is talking about this has nothing to do with far as uh when it says to uh, don't untouch the uh, uh, not touching things that are uh, unclean far as meats. It has nothing to do with it. It has something to do with uh, spiritual who you're hanging with, basically who you who you dealing with. Uh, uh, your communication, light with darkness. This is what this is talking about. Who you fellowshipping with? Are you unequally yoked? That's what that's talking about. Okay, well, I, I didn't say that that was dealing with me. I actually asked you what it was dealing with, and you gave me an answer. The reason that I asked you that, so this is talking about. A physical thing. Now you just said that it was talking about idolatry. So is not idolatry in the law, or in in, in the ten and the royal law, and also in the so-called law of Moses? Well, actually, when I gave my opening statement, I told you even when you look at uh, Acts, when it comes to the New Testament, it tells you that you should not bow down to idols, nor eat things offered to idols. That is in the New Testament. Okay, cool. So let me ask you this: in Acts chapter eleven, verse eight. When Peter replied and said to the Lord, but I said, not so, Lord, for nothing common or unclean have at any time entered into my mouth. Now, what I want to ask you is, being that uh, Peter was an apostle to Christ, uh, wouldn't he know if the dietary law was not, um, if the dietary law was not valid no more after Christ's death? Well, actually, Peter himself, if you look at it, the temple was still standing. Peter then was still following the law when he could because he was big. He, some feast days he didn't get a chance to keep due to the fact of him being persecuted and couldn't even come to Jerusalem. And uh, and so he he was uh, the temple was the last thing that we see that was sprinkled with blood to fade away. This is why the book of Hebrews say the law which waxed and ready to decay away because they was he the author of Hebrews was under the, the temple was uh, was on earth at that time. So that was the last thing that we see that was sprinkled with blood that was there heaven and earth at that time. So yes, he Peter was as we see was following up under the law to 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 what he what he could do. You know what I'm saying supposedly whatever the case may be, but he was even confronted with certain things even in the book of Galatians because he was eating with the Gentiles and uh, uh he was he, he was living as the manner of Gentiles do when Paul confronted him. So when you look at this, this is this this has uh you know you know this really doesn't really have no substance for reals like that I okay cool so so let's go to something else you brought up let's go to colossians the second chapter uh you brought this up about the no judge and the meat so i want to read this real quick so this second colossians um verse 16 it said let no man therefore judge you in me or in drink or in respect of a holy day or in new moon and of sabbath days so i have to ask you uh uh g con you do know that he's actually talking to the Gentiles, right? The people that will be converting over to this new religion of Christianity. You do know that, right? Right. Talking to okay. yeah, Gentiles, yeah, uh, Gentiles, yeah. Okay, cool. So if if the if these Israelite Christians, because that's who they were, who were going who, who was going to convert them, were not keeping the new moons, the Sabbaths, the holidays, or the drinks of meat, if they weren't keeping the dietary law. Why would he tell the Gentiles to not, not let nobody judge you? In? You do understand that the other Gentiles were the ones that were saying, man, you ain't got to keep no dietary law. You ain't got to keep no new moon. You ain't got to keep no Sabbath because this is what the Israelites who were Christians was keeping. So do you not understand that, that that's that's the real narrative of how that go? Well, actually, that's not the narrative. When you actually go farther, you see what's going on here. It's actually Judaizers. Judaizers is following them, chasing them, trying to glory in their flesh, telling the Gentiles that they must keep the law and also be circumcised, as we read in Acts chapter 15. Hence, this is why when we look at the letters that was going out among the Gentiles to tell them that they did not tell 
these Jews to be doing no such thing. So was the people who's actually judging them here is those who are Judaizers that are doing those things and not actually uh uh you know uh what you what you're saying at all. All right, all right. So we're gonna allow G Con to now interrogate. Set the timer for 10 minutes. G Con, whenever you're ready, you can begin your interrogation. All right, cool. So uh my first question is is um did Adam have the Sabbath? Did Adam have the Sabbath? Yes. Can you show where Adam kept the Sabbath in the in the book? Uh, no, I can't. I can't show where it's written that he uh, kept the Sabbath. Not on not on top hand. No. Uh, do you believe that Moses was the author of the of the of Genesis? You mean did he? Is he the one that wrote it down? Yes. Him, his scribes, yeah. So why wouldn't Moses um, mention anything about the Sabbath until we get to the law of uh, till we get to till we start getting into the wilderness? Why wouldn't he mention none of those things about the Sabbath during Adam's time? Well, I mean, it's a few things that we know wasn't written straight out in law. You can go into hell. You know, you don't get until what you see Noah that you see clean and unclean, seven clean, two and unclean. You also see about sacrifices. But it wasn't laid out in a law written. So a lot of things were oral before they was written down. Okay. So as a, to that, when you say clean and unclean, mm -hmm. uh, are you, are, uh, um, I have a question here. It could uh, have been sacrifices. Right. Because when you say clean and unclean, what do you think about Genesis 8 and 20? It says, and Noah built an altar unto the Lord and took of the, every clean beast. And of mm -hmm. every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar, and the Lord smelled a sweet savior, and the Lord said his heart, said in his heart that he will not curse the ground again. That the question I have for you is this is is a roebuck clean or deer clean? Say that again. Is a roebuck clean or oh, deer clean? Yes, they are. Um, it says in this verse right here, it says that he offered on the altar. Right. Of every clean beast, a burnt offering, and it was a sweet smell offering. Can you offer, is it clean to offer a deer or a roebuck or a gazelle on the altar of the Lord as a sweet smelling savior? Not under Levitical law when it was written down, no. So why did you bring up clean and unclean as if it was making reference to the Levitical law then? I didn't say it was making reference to Levitical law. I said it was making a uh, reference to the sacrifices that he made. That's exactly what I said. Right. So these sacrifices and the clean sacrifices that we see here would have to be sacrifices then that were something that was suitable for the altar. That were sweet smelling savors and not as you would try to say, uh, the unclean here would be pork, but actually it was unclean or not clean. A gazelle and a zebra, I mean, a gazelle and Robux are not clean things to offer on the idol just as well. I mean, on the, on the offer, just as, on the altar, just as well. So another question I have for you is this is yeah. um, before you get to your next question, I hope the audience know I never made that argument. You interjected that. All right, cool. So, so um, uh, in, 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 in Genesis uh, nine and three, uh, yeah. it says that in Genesis nine and three, let group, let's go there. It says, and, and, and every moving thing that lives should be meat for you, even as I've given green herb, I have given you all things. Now let's mm -hmm. go to and the fear of you and the dread of you should be upon every beast of the earth and upon every fowl of the air, upon all that move upon the earth, upon all the fishes of the sea, until your hands have I delivered them. Now, can I ask you a question? Go ahead. Would God give them every living, moving thing to be eaten here? Oh, that's the simple answer. And you're going to love this one. So you can never use it again. Well, we understand before the, uh, the the laws was textualized, like in Leviticus, it was certain things that were not put emphasis on. Just like at that same time, guess what else you could do? You could marry your brother. You could marry, you could marry a close in-law. You could have babies with him. So that's null and void. Can okay. So clearly, so clearly <laughs> we see that Abraham isaac i mean abraham isaac jacob and all of them we see they were not up under the law of moses when it came to the dietary law 
You cannot use clean and unclean there because it's not in reference to the Levitical law, what can be eaten, the suitable to be eaten, uh, but but things that are suitable for the altar uses or use for uses uh use purposes. Now I have another question for you. A uh, circumcision. Uh, okay. Let me interject before you go to the next question. I hope everybody see I never made any of the arguments that he made. You had them pre-prepared right, for me. Fine, that's fine. I, I, I got to move on, brother. I got to move on. I didn't All ask right, you. Yeah, I, right, I don't right. need to get anything. Let's, this is 1 Corinthians 7 and 18. It okay, says, it says, uh, you say 7 and 18, bro? Yeah, is circumcision a requirement of to, to is, is being circumcised a requirement to, uh, in the New Testament? Uh, you say is circumcision a requirement in the New Testament? Yes. Yes, it is. Okay, then why in the Council of Acts 15 and 1, I mean Acts 15, and also uh, in verses 15 and 1, it says, And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. And then you jump to Acts 15 and 24. It says, For as much as we have heard that certain which went out from you from us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls, saying that ye may be circumcised, you must be circumcised, and keep the law to whom we gave no no such commandment. Now, why mm -hmm. is it that when we look at this, the apostles that were gathered together under the anointing of the Holy Spirit says they gave no such commandment to keep the law of Moses, nor to be circumcised here in Acts 15 and 24. Okay, that's no problem. If you notice, right, if you go to, and I'm going to answer it with scripture, so bear with me. If you notice and go right over to Acts 16 and 3, let's see what happens. Him will Paul have to go forth with him and took and circumcised him because of the Jews, which were in those quarters, for they knew all that his father was a Greek. So if it would have been a curse, you know what I'm saying? He wouldn't curse his brother just because the Jews was punishing him. I'll show you what he was doing. This is the second part of my answer, if you don't mind. Let's go to First uh, Corinthians chapter 9, and I'll show you why he did that. First Corinthians chapter 9. I don't why he did it, though. No, I'm, I'm showing you with the script. Right, he said he did it because of the Jews. Bro, let me finish. Yeah, yeah, I said. I just I just told you, but well, I'm showing well, you. The I'm, Jews were trying to kill Paul, or was, was they right? Brother, let me finish. Right, go what, ahead, bro. Right. What I'm telling you is why the whole circumcision thing even came up. Basically, if you look at it, why was Paul even telling the Gentiles that they didn't have to be circumcised? And so I'm going to show I'm, I'm going to show you. So let's go to, uh, I want to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. That's what I was trying to do, bro. Just, just bear with me, bro. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And uh, I want to read, give me one sec. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And this is uh, verse 20. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. It says, and unto the Jews I became as a Jew, and I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, and, and, and them that are under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law, and to them that are without the law, as without the law, being not with the law, without the law to God, but unto the law to Christ, that I might gain them as well. So when he was going around the Gentiles, of course, he'd tell them, Man, Joe, look, you just need to come on over. We're gonna give you a little stuff of stain from blood. You ain't got to worry about cutting your pecker. I'm already telling you to get rid of your God. So to them, he was being them. He was trying to pull them out. He's being All political. Right, cool. So, All right, cool. So my question is this is a uh, twofold question here. Okay, first of all, I'm glad you went to this text because you kind of helped me out here. Is there a cool. distinction between the law of Christ and also the law of Moses here? Uh, in, certain, in certain aspects, yeah. Like I said, you have to cont uh, contextualize everything. You can't blanket it. So then it has the law of Moses been fulfilled according to uh, uh, Matthew 5 and 17 when he says not one jot or tittle shall pass from the law to all be fulfilled. Say that again. Has uh, has has the law of Moses been fulfilled according to uh, Matthew 5 and, and uh, 17 when he says not one jot or tittle shall pass from the law until all be fulfilled. Now, the sacrificial law, the schoolmaster, and all that has been fulfilled. And of course, the prophecies. So it's passed from the so 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 basically has something you because you just confirmed that there is a distinction between the law of Christ and the law of Christ. I've been saying it. 
Okay, so if you're saying that, then why did you bring that argument up when we had the argument? I mean, why did you bring it up earlier when you said when you talked about the least of the commandments? Did Christ himself uh was he talking about uh the 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 jot and the tittle laws of Moses or was he was he talking about the New Testament laws of those teachings? How could he be talking about the New Testament laws when they weren't even written yet, unless he was getting them from the old testament? Well, actually, he was giving them right there on the mount. That's what I made in my opening statements. He was giving them things on the mount, teaching them on the mount. Remember, they wanted to hear from the prophet, and he was the prophet. No, uh, if you go to when the young man asked him, "How do I get eternal life?" and he went straight to the Ten Commandments, which is the royal law that you call the law of Moses. That was the law he was reciting. That law is not done away with. No dot, no all right. trick. All right, all right. So, uh, shout out to both debaters. We're gonna. Keep this thing going with the closing. We're going to start out with Brother G. Khan. We're going to set this thing for five minutes. And uh, whenever you're ready, brother, you can begin your closing. All right, cool. So uh, what we find out is, is a lot of these guys, they can uh, scrutinize basically a lot of uh, texts. Uh, well, not scrutinize. They can put out a lot of texts. But then when you begin to scrutinize and look, look at that and, and get into the text with a glass eye and exegete the text, is pro text properly, then what you start to see is that these guys begin to crack and fold because they don't understand really the law, the terms of the conditions. Now, when you look at 1 Corinthians 7 and 18, uh, I didn't get to ask, ask, ask him that, but uh, Paul says, is any man caught being circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Is any called in uncircumcision? Let him not be circumcised. So what he's saying is if you're called and you are circumcised, don't be uncircumcised in heart. And if you are called and you uncircumcised, you don't need to be circumcised because you are. He says that you are uh, uh, under the you are. Uh, it's your priority to do the whole law. And he actually stated this earlier when you look at Galatians uh, chapter, um, I believe it's chapter five. I'm going to have to stop using this. Um, chapter 5 and 3. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Once again, you had Jews that was chasing believers around, especially Gentiles and uh, not non-Israelites, and telling them that you have to be circumcised to keep the law, subverting the very souls of the Israelites, I mean, of the, uh, non, the Gentiles. And so, once again, you have... Uh, Mikael and Israel doing the same thing, going around telling people that they got to be circumcised and they got to keep the Sabbath. And when it says clearly in the scriptures that we read that, you know, you should, you're going to have to mute your mic, brother. You flipping pages in the back. Um, oh, my bad. And so uh appreciate it, brother. And so clearly the text says, you know, in, in Galatians, it says that, you know, you observe days and months and times and years. Paul was afraid of them because he, the, the very Gentiles who he had converted over, you know, they went back trying to be justified up under the law. And they had Jews like Mikael following them around, edging them on, trying to glory in their flesh, come out to be circumcised. And Paul was just telling you why he did certain things for them to be circumcised because of fear of the Jews. But otherwise, God was not telling him to do that. And clearly, there is a distinction between the law of God the law of Moses and also the law of Christ. Christ came to instruct them uh, uh, some ways that we see that uh, was, was not formal ways. Uh, the Bible says that the Lord said, I will do a new thing. They will tell you what well, the Lord does not change. Not what well, he said that I will do a new thing. And he says a new covenant will he uh, give unto the house of Israel, the house of uh, uh, both houses. And so we see that even in that covenant in the book of Hebrews, it said that that covenant has come to pass. And so we see that at the time, even though the temple was still standing, we still see that those that were in Christ was walking in that covenant. And those that was, was outside of that covenant, those people were up under the penalties of the first covenant because they did not believe on the one who can deliver them from the penalties of that first covenant, which was Christ. And so this brother, it, once you begin to get him up under the lens and deal with his information, and, you know, and, and chase him down, especially if you got time and you begin to see that, that what he's saying is not solid at all. It has no foundation that he's standing on feathers and trying to think it's a, it's a solid uh, a rock or something like that. Uh, Ezekiel 4, 13, even, the, even 
Thus shall the children of Israel eat their defiled bread among the Gentiles, whether I have driven them. This was the lesson taught by the eating of the kind of bread described and cooked with the dung. The Jews were to eat the foul bread among the Gentiles while they will be driven by God, driven out by God. So clearly we've seen already that the Jew, that, that this brother couldn't possibly be eating, uh, dealing with the dietary loss. He's worried about what you eat. And it's a, a really a heart condition, if anything, overall with Christ, the things that Christ was talking about, which was the, the bigger things that he was dealing with. You worried about ceremonial things when your heart ain't even right. You know what I'm saying? I'm not saying that this brother's heart ain't right, but I'm just saying in general, this is what he was telling the Jews. And so, you know, these are the things we had to look at. We looked in Genesis 8 and 20, and also we got to understand that Abraham was justified before he was even circumcised. He was counted righteous before he was circumcised, and he was given the circumcision as a sign or a token. It's a sign and it's a token. And what is the sign and token? It points to Christ. Christ is the fulfillment of the very circumcision. Why do I need to cut in my flesh anymore when Christ has come? All right. All right. All right. Shout out to Brother G. Khan. We're going to hand this thing over now to Brother Mikhail. Whenever you're ready, brother, you could begin your closing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. My, bro my brother burnt up a lot of time. Um, uh, you know, that was a nice little exhortation, but I'm gonna let the book close out. Like I opened up with, um, <clears throat> now, like I was saying, um, if you go, the brother said a lot of things against the circumcision and a lot of things against, he already made it look like according to, uh, Matthew chapter 15, that he went against Matthew five and actually taught people it was okay. Uh, to eat whatever because it don't defile you as the heart now what he was right is it is a heart condition because you can get a real bad heart condition if you eat too much pork so let's look at this joe john chapter 7 verse 22 what i read earlier he kept bringing up the sabbath day if not it's important it said moses therefore gave unto you circumcision not because it is of moses but of the fathers and ye on the sabbath day circumcise a man that they look they, he, uh, Jesus telling them, man, y'all trying to catch me up for healing somebody on the Sabbath, but didn't y'all circumcise on the Sabbath? But let me show you how Jesus know how important both circumcision and the Sabbath is. Watch this, verse 23. If a man on the Sabbath day receives circumcision, that the law of Moses should not be broken. What? Jesus never promote breaking Moses' law? Listen to this. So that the law of Moses should not be broken. Are ye angry at me because I have made a man every wit hold on the Sabbath day? So he's telling you if the eighth day come up for you to be circumcised and it happened to fall on the seventh day, uh, Sabbath day, you still get cut so that the law don't be broken. That means you're doing good on the Sabbath. This is what my uh, what Bible verse was that, brother. That was uh that that was John. Chapter seven, that was verses uh, 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 22 and 23. I like to also read something else. I like to read this. This is uh, a little secular history. And this comes from uh, an article concept for the modern day religious movement seen as Messianic Judaism. Part of the series of Jewish Christianity, the Sermon on the Mount that he was talking about. And this is by Carl Bloch. Carl Bloch with the C. You spell his last name B-L-O-C-H. 1834 to 1890. Uh, I'm going to go down to the meaty part because my time is short. And this is what it says. It says, uh, Christianity in the earliest stage, the community was made up of all those Jews who believed that Jesus was the Jewish Messiah. As Christianity grew and developed, Jewish Christians became only one stand of the early Christian community, uh, correct, characterized by combining the confession of Jesus as the Christ continue or observance of the Torah and adherence to Jewish traditions, such as Sabbath observance, Jewish calendar, Jewish laws and customs, circumcision, kosher diet, and synagogue attendance, and by a direct genetic relationship to the earliest followers of Jesus Christ, which cut everything that he said, literally, but I got to go out with the book. So I want to make it even better because it was something he brought up earlier. And I hear a lot of people mention this, but they don't know what it means. Let's go to first Timothy. So I'm going to go to first Timothy, the fourth chapter. And I'm going to read this. It says, uh, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. 
forbidden to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which god have created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth now this is what he needs to know is this talking about the dietary law no this is talking about a sect of monks who later the roman catholic church picked up if you go look up the roman catholic church early practices it tell you that they forbidden you from eating meat because if you notice what it say after that and abstain from marriage when did the law tell us to abstain from marriage it told us to get married some even had more than one wife and produce but christians love to throw that out there too because they don't know how to read the bible in context it's never talking about a dietary law if you go look up the christians uh the catholics right now they had a time like you got like lent and stuff but they had whole times where if you want to be holy you could not eat meat and you could not get married that's why the pope don't get married that's why a nun does not get married for her to be considered holy. So, like I say, this was uh, definitely um, a fun debate. It was definitely, I believe, edifying for my people. Um, but I just got to say, you know, uh, thanks for the fight, g -Con. I think it was a good one. But if you ask me, bro, you kind of uh, put your foot in your own mouth. But I definitely enjoyed it. And um, I say grace and peace to you. Uh, hi, hi, hi. Shout out to both the babies. Very interesting debate. Very detailed and well, uh, well um, delivered debate on both parts. Uh, but it's time now to get into the interrogation family. So with that being said, with that being said, who should I interrogate first family? Man, get him. Okay, so uh, the brother G Khan is conceding. I mean, uh, Mikhail is conceding. Um, G Khan, what's going on, brother? Um, let's start from the top here. Let's see, let's go to. Let's go to Romans chapter seven. Uh, let's go to Romans chapter seven, verse seven, Romans seven and seven. Right. It says, uh, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. But sin, that, but sin taking occasion by the commandment wrought in me, all manner of con conception. Well, what's that word? Concessions or something like that. All right. <laughs> for without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life I found to be unto death, for sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me, God forbid, but sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me, by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. So, brother, um, what are you getting out of these verses here? Um, this is basically uh, Paul uh, up under the law and him being up under the law, having the emotions that we see of the 
motions of being in the flesh of uh, the spirit warring against the the flesh battle and so this is what he's going through and so he talks about how you know that before the law came he was alive but when the law came it showed him that he was in sin it's just like if i always make the example to where you are when you're driving and you're doing the speed limit i mean you're driving you're just driving if you don't see a speed limit you're just driving but eventually if you have a speed limit and then you're doing it is posted and written and you're doing over that speed limit then you have to come into those guidelines if not then you're going to be penalized so this is basically what he's talking about he's talking about that once the law came it killed him due to the fact of it showed him that he was in sin and therefore he had to be judged by the law so what law is he making reference to he's making law to the law of moses all right so um do you make a distinction between the laws of moses and the laws of christ yes there is a distinction as the brother noted earlier to this as well all right so um explain that distinction all right so um one of the distinctions that we see is in romans i mean it's uh, in uh john i mean matthew chapter five when you start looking at some of the things that christ is teaching those are things that we see that are distinct from what the law teaches, uh, the law of Moses. And so one of the things we look at as if um, when he talks about um, to love those or pray for those that despitefully use you. Uh, those are things that we see that in the law of Moses, it does not happen. Uh, also, too, uh, when Christ, when the lady came to Christ and, and, and Christ um they he called they knew that he was really the judge in general because if he's calling himself to be the judge and he said that his words will judge them they was looking for him to judge to, to to judge the woman but he says grace and truth came by him and so he did not come to do that and he says if any man without sin cast the first stone so he's showing them there that listen that he will have mercy uh uh before anything that he he will his mercy is there and so that's what he's doing right there. He says grace and truth. So he's coming to have mercy. Uh, Brother Mikhail. Yeah, what's up, bro? Um, do you make a distinction between the laws of Moses and the laws of Christ? Uh, let's go to the book real quick. Yes or no? Uh, the, on, the only distinction I make about the laws of Christ is that he expounds on it spiritually. For example, when he say, uh, if a man look upon a woman, you know what I'm saying? He say that uh, you've already committed adultery in your heart. You didn't see that in the letter. So basically what he's telling you is he added covetousness to it because you can covet somebody's wife. So he added that with it. So that's what he meant. So like okay. those type of things, yeah. So those type. So, so you're saying that there was no um, changing of the law, like um, in the Old Testament, I was forbidden to eat something, and now in the New Testament, I'm allowed to eat. Something. No way, no okay. way, no way on earth did Christ change that. No. Okay, okay, okay. All right, got you. So um. Okay, then uh, with that being said, uh, back to G-Con. Let's go to um. He actually said in the debate, he said that the Gentiles, the things was changed concerning the Gentiles, which was weird because he said that the Gentiles wasn't given the laws that the Jews was given. So there had to be a change there. And eventually the Jews had to come over to what the Gentiles was doing just as well, too. Let's go to Matthew. Uh, five and ten. Matthew five and ten. Yeah. Hold on a second. Let me see. Uh, Matthew 5 and 22. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Matthew 5 and 22. It says, But I say unto you, whosoever is angry with his brother and without cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother Raka shall be in danger of the council, but whoever shall say 
thou fool shall be in danger of the hellfire. I guess that's what he was already making reference to when he was saying, like, you know, um, um, the the slight changes uh, of the law that Christ made. So let's go to let's go to John seven and twenty two. John seven and twenty two. Uh, seven and twenty two. All right. Uh, John 7 and 22, it says, Moses therefore gave you circumcision, not because of, not because it is of Moses, but of the fathers. And ye, on the Sabbath day, circumcise a man. If a man on the Sabbath day receives circumcision, that the law of Moses should not be broken. Are ye angry at me because I have made a man every wit old on the Sabbath? Just not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. All right, so um, what do you have to say about this, what Christ was making reference to pertaining to um, the law of Moses? Because really he's saying that it's not the law of Moses, but the law of God, right? Right. Basically, the the, um, circumcision was given before the Sabbath was. And so the law was added 430 years after that, after the promise. And the the circumcision was actually given to Moses, I mean, to uh, Abraham. And so circumcision was adopted into the law of Moses as a sign and a token. But the circumcision pointed to Christ the whole time. So I don't know what what, what was his point for this. Uh, I think he was trying to say. And so many words uh, that uh, we see that uh, um, Abraham circumcised, so therefore it was a necessity uh, for other people to circumcise. I, I don't know if that's the point that he was making. Do you uh, do you believe that that's a requirement still, circumcision? Uh, not actually, because uh, it doesn't cause you to be righteous. Um, when we look at um, it's a, it's a sign and it's a token of Christ. It points to Christ. I and think so, that his point was. I think his point is that. That is part of uh, the covenant, right? Right. That's that's what he would. That's what he would. He would. Um, he would say, um, as far as the um, that Moses therefore gave unto you circumcision, not because it is of Moses, but of the fathers. Right. Right. And so when we when we start looking at at, at what circumcision is and why those who are up under the New Testament wasn't allowed to do it, then we start going to chapters like Acts chapter fifteen. That's when I took him to Acts 15 when it says a certain man came down from the dead. What you talking about right here, though? Right. That's that's basically what he was talking about. In other words, he's telling them, listen, Moses gave you circumcision, right? And it was not of Moses, but it was of the father, right? That's what it was of. So I have I have no, you know what I'm saying, no, no problem with that at all. I'm trying to make sure what is he trying to reference here? Is he saying that circumcision is something that is needful today, or is that is that his argument, or what is it? Was there any abolishment of the circumcision? Yeah, the New Testament. Uh, the New Testament does not command circumcision. So when was this abolished? Uh, let's look at it over here in uh, Acts fifteen and one when they had the council of it. It says, "This is Acts fifteen and one, and certain men which came down from Judea." taught the brethren and said, except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. Acts 15 and 24, the, the, the couple verses down says, for as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your soul, saying ye must be circumcised and keep the law to whom we gave no such commandment. And so then we look at Paul. Paul is telling you that if a person he telling you that if a person desires to be circumcised upon the, uh, by the law of Moses, they must do the whole law of Moses. And then Paul also states in Romans, he says that a man, he says Abraham was justified uh, before he was circumcised. And it says that we can walk in the steps of Abraham being yet circumcised and be justified just as well. We don't have to be circumcised because Christ has already come, who is the circumcision. And who was circumcised the hearts 
And this is why he was saying it's not what entered into a heart that defile a man. I mean, what enter into the body that defile a man, but what come out, comes outside of the heart. So Christ is coming to deal with the heart and he's the circumciser of the heart. So what this brother saying, it doesn't even make any sense what he's saying, because it's not even nothing that's moral anyways. Uh, brother Mikhail. Yeah, I already know what you asked me. Is that what I meant by uh, taking you there? Yeah, exactly. And this goes against totally what G Khan just said. The reason I brought that up is because of this. And G Khan does agree that this is future. Ezekiel chapter 44 and verse 6. And this is what it reads. And thou shalt say to the rebellions, even to the house of Israel, thus saith the Lord God, O ye house of Israel, let it suffice you in all your abominations. And that ye brought into my sanctuary strangers, the Gentiles he was talking about, uncircumcised in heart and uncircumcised in flesh, to be in my sanctuary, to pollute it. Even my house, when you offer your bread and fat and blood, they have broken my covenant because of your abominations. Verse 9, thus saith the Lord God, no stranger uncircumcised in heart nor uncircumcised in flesh shall enter into my sanctuary or any stranger that is among the children of Israel. So he just killed himself again. That's what I was trying to tell you. So you, you got to get cut because you have to get cut to even get in the king. All right. Thanks a lot, Billy Mikhail. Um, you can now go to, um, let's go to, uh, let's go to Corinthians. Let's go to first Corinthians, uh, chapter nine, verse 20. Right. But, uh, let me respond to that real quick before you do that, because, um, uh, uh, first of all, when you die and you die and you're uncircumcised, um, uh, what's, what spiritual temple or what temple that they going to be going into anyways? That's temple for natural fleshly people in the in the millennium. That has nothing to do with you or anybody else. Just in that case, you might as well start circumcising on the eighth day, which we don't do when we have children anyways. And that's the law, too. So therefore, your circumcision is counted as uncircumcision if it's not according to the law. Go ahead, brother. Uh, chapter one, chapter nine, verse 20, Corinthians, first Corinthians. It says, and unto the Jews, I became as a Jew that I might gain the Jews to them that are under the law as under the law that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law of law to Christ that I might gain them that are without law. So the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might be all means save some. But that I might by all means save some. What are you getting out of this, brother? Okay, as we can see, for the Jews, I became a Jew. Now, Paul is already if he if he's walking as as the Jews and this is something that he's teaching, you know, uh, every day, then why is it he says I became a Jew? He says that I might gain the Jews. That's why he says he did that. But he knows that really in reality that there is no that, that the burden that we see or the yoke that we see that was placed on their necks, which was the law of Moses, that it's, it's, it's God has actually torn that, ripped that. That's why he went into the veil and ripped that and tore that to pieces. It says to them that are under the law as under the law, right? That I might gain them that are under the law. So when he was among them, he did what they did. But we see why he did what they did because he wanted to gain them. And also we see that there was a fear there among him because they was chasing him all around Asia and, and, and also Africa or whatever the place may be in Rome. Europe. Then we look what he says to them that without law as without law, but he says he stops there being not without law to God, but under the law of to Christ. So there's a distinction between under the law, which is the law of Moses, and also uh, under the law to Christ. The Michael admitted that, which New Testaments follow up under, that I might gain them that are without law. And so Christ is dealing once again with the circumcision of the heart. 
eat not, handle not, all these carnal things that we see of meats and stuff like that, that's not a moral condition. That don't defile a man. What defiles a man, what comes out of his heart, and that's evil things, covetous with the things that he spoke of on earlier. So he says, I became weak that I might gain them that were weak. He says he's doing all of these things that he might save some, and, and, and this I do for the gospel's sakes, that I might be partaker thereof with you. Paul in Romans chapter 9 actually expounds on that, that he can wish himself accursed that his brother might be saved. So this is something that Paul always did to let you know that he went the farthest to save people and get people delivered. And that's all they're saying there. So you're saying that um, I'm trying to understand I'm trying to understand at what point was this this adjustment made pertaining to the law or the strict codes of the law or the ritualistic practices of the law that you think that is not needed anymore? Well, mainly among the Christians, it was made early on, and also some some apostles and certain things that we see that eventually later on it came among them, especially when the temple was destroyed. They so couldn't. What you, so, what do you think that Christ was making reference to when he said? That not one jot and one tittle shall be taken from the law till all is fulfilled. Okay, he's making reference to the law of Moses and also reference to the fulfilling of the things that he was going to fulfill in the law of Moses according to his death. So and, you think that you think they're always fulfilled? Uh, uh all I think that everything that was concerning his death and also concerning uh, him also what was said and how he was going to bring them from under the law was definitely fulfilled. Uh, so when you think that uh, what he was making reference to when he said all is fulfilled, you think that that is has been fulfilled already? Uh, the fulfillment of what was concerning his death and also those types and foreshadows that was in the law concerning his death. So you think, you believe that through the death of Christ, that um, it kind of separated us from having to practice or being subjugated to um, a lot of the tenets, a lot of the harsh tenets of the law or a lot of the strict codes of the law? Uh, definitely because when we look at, for instance, one of the things we look at is um, Leviticus uh, chapter 18. And, and uh, look what it says. Ye shall, this is 18 and 4, Leviticus 18 and 4. Ye shall do my judgments and keep my ordinance to walk therein. I am the Lord your God. Ye shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, and which if a man do, he shall live in them. So what Paul is showing you here is, I mean, what the Old Testament scripture is showing you is that you're not even under the judgments that you were supposed to be judging by. Remember, if a person don't keep the Sabbath day, he's supposed to get stoned. He's supposed to get killed. But you can't do that now. So Paul, so so so, so, so Christ is transferring them from the old to the New Testament. That's why he said, "This is my blood of the New Testament," because he knows that you're not going to worship in this place, which is Jerusalem, nor on this mountain. But those that worship God will worship worship Him in spirit and truth. So there's no way you can do these civil things and call yourself trying to. Uh, Fulfill the law of Moses because you go that ain't gonna work. He says he, he already told you, you know. So when Christ is saying these things, there's certain things that we see that has come into the New Testament, but all of the things we see in the old has not come into the New Testament, and therefore your jot and tittle is 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 is, 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 is has been changed, and heaven and earth had to, would have had to have passed in Christ. All right, thanks a lot, brother. We're gonna move forward too. Brother Mikael, Brother Mikael, what's good? I'll meet your mic, brother. Oh, uh, what up, bro? Uh, My brother. All right, all right. So, Brother Mikael, do you believe that the law of Moses has been fulfilled? No. Um. Why so? Well, it's too many reasons. Um, as you see, a couple of the things that you caught on and write down, good, you got a good ear. 
where you never see Jesus saying, you know, do away with these. Even the question that you asked about the passing away of the heaven and earth. Now, I noticed G. Khan didn't bring it up during this debate because he knew I was on top of it. But he likes to quote Josephus in public because uh, Josephus says that heaven and earth meet the temple was destroyed. But if I take you to the scriptures and see what the Israelites, uh, even though he was an Israelite, the Israelites in that time said heaven and earth was, it was the creation of our God. And so, no, if, if the law of Moses or if the Ten Commandments or if the royal law was done away with, when the man asked Jesus, how do I obtain eternal life? He wouldn't have went straight to the Ten Commandments. It makes no sense. And also, may I add that you remember uh, G. Khan, like I do, believe that Jesus was a prophet like unto Moses. But yet in his debate, he almost tried to make it seem as if he was opposed to Moses. That he was a total different than Moses and was against him. It makes no sense. All right. So um, what do you think Jesus came to do? Jesus came, as what the book says, Jesus came, of course, to uh, bring salvation. We know we was under, it was, and it's a lot of things under that. We know it was a schoolmaster. People were, matter of fact, I'll just take you up. Let's go to, uh, let's go to Hebrews. We'll go to Hebrews. So I'm going to take it to, uh, go to the book of Hebrews with me, Sola. Mm -hmm. I'd like to let the book explain it a little bit better than I can. So bear with me. Uh, let me see. Let's go to uh, Hebrews. Let me see. I'll pick it up at hmm, so many spots. Hebrews. I think I'll go to chapter seven. So I'll go to Hebrews chapter seven. Uh, Hebrews chapter seven. And let me see. I'll pick it up here. It says, for this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the most high God, who met Abraham, returned from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth of all, first being interpreted king of righteousness, also king of Salem, which the king of peace. Uh, I'm going to skip down some. Um, now consider how great this man was unto who Abraham gave a tenth. Verily, they that are the sons of Levi who received the office of the priesthood have a commandment to tithes of people receiving the law that it is of their brethren. Also, they that came from the loins of Abraham. So I'm going to skip down because I don't want to take you too long. It says, uh, OK, verse 11. If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there another priest should arise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron. For the priesthood being changed, there is made a necessity change also, uh, also of the law. For he whom these things are spoken pertaining to another tribe, meaning Judah, because we know Jesus came out of Judah, which no man gave attendance to at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, which the tribe Moses spake nothing of concerning the priesthood. Skip down to verse 16. Who is made uh, not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of the endless life, for he that testified that are priests forever out of the order of Melchizedek. 19, for the, for the law made nothing perfect, but that bringing in better hope did, which you draw not unto, unto thee. For those priests were made without an oath, but with the oath by him that said unto him, the Lord swear and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. By so much was Jesus made a surety a better testament. So if you continue reading on your own, also in the eighth chapter, the ninth chapter, it really ends it all in the 10th chapter. It tells you that the carnal ordinances was the things that the priest had to do during the sacrifices around the temple. It tells you that a priest had to keep coming. You had some that was steady. You had some, of course, you had to come yearly and you had to keep on coming doing these sacrifices for sins. So it's telling you now that Christ come and you didn't, he did not desire the blood of bulls and goats. Therefore, he came to be that offering so that we under grace. So now when we commit a sin, bro, being that we cast it out and we don't have no temple with no Levites or nothing like that to go up there and take care of it. We pray to God and repent. And Jesus Christ under the order of Melchizedek is there as our intercessor from his blood that he sacrificed so that we can get forgiveness from the father. So you're saying that, you know, based off of that, you're saying that there's certain things 
that we had to do under the law of Moses uh, ritualistically um, to. You just hit it. As, you just hit it a, ritualistically. You just hit as, it ritualistically. As a, as a way of um, cleansing the sins. And right. you're saying that Jesus uh, did away with that? I, I'm saying that Jesus fulfilled that. Because it was a schoolmaster leading up to him coming. That's why he and said. So, so you say he fulfilled that. So, um, mm -hmm. do you believe that that could be the same argument that G Con was making for the circumcision? No, because it don't mention the circumcision. It literally tells you in Hebrews what he's talking about, and it's talking about the sacrifice. Okay, so you uh, okay? So I, I think G Con's argument was saying that yes. Things like that, as well as um, other things such as what we eat, and also um, it don't it don't it. right. I, I I heard clearly what his argument was, and he was, you know, that was his argument. That's not what the book said. Um, let's go to Matthew chapter fifteen, verse eleven. Okay, you say Matthew fifteen and eleven. Yeah. All right. Okay, uh, my bad. Go ahead. Uh, it says, Not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the mouth, this defileth a man. Mm -hmm. Okay. And again, my answer is the same as that I told him. You know, I'm going to be direct. I ain't going to do all that long talking. I'm going to let the book answer me. Let's look at the subject. The subject was, then came Jesus' scribes and the Pharisees, which were Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. So the whole subject was, you got these dirty hands. You're, getting, you're defiling all the bread that's down here. Other people got to dig their hands in there and eat bread. And then you're putting it in your mouth and you're eating it. Jesus is saying, man, look, this bread is not defiled because it got dirt on it, or this meat that you're eating is not defiled because it got dirt on it. You know what I'm saying? That was the whole context of the conversation. Then he goes on to tell them what you need to be worried more about is what come out of there, because most of those, most of the Pharisees, we know, were hypocrites. And to further go along with it, uh, Matthew chapter five is why I went there, and he said that if anybody, uh, uh, goes against the law, breaks the law, and then teaches others to do so, they will be considered least in the kingdom. So that would make Jesus literally a hypocrite. And if I might add one last thing, if you don't mind, my brother, to really show that that's not the case. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 66. So I'm going to go to Isaiah chapter 66 because g I, I, I know for a fact, he knows that this is talking about Christ's return. So let's listen to this. Now we really got a problem because this is literally a prophecy about Christ. So this is Isaiah chapter 66. And this is what he said. He says, um, uh, let me see. I'll also choose, uh, excuse me, one second. Okay, here we go. Verse 15. For behold, the Lord will come with fire and with his chariots like a whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. For by fire and by his sword, where the Lord plead with all flesh and the slain of the Lord shall be many. They that sanctify themselves and purify themselves in the garden behind one tree in the midst, eating swine's flesh and the abomination and the mouse shall be consumed together, saith the Lord. So we know this is a prophecy about Jesus Christ, the same one that we were just reading, talking in Matthew chapter 15. He's the same one saying he's going to come back for killing you. He's going to come back and kill you for eating swine's flesh and other abominations like rat soup. <laughs> All right, brother. Uh, let's go to Mark chapter 7, verse 15 to 23. Uh, Mark 7. Okay, give me one second. I got a big old Bible. Mark 7. <clears throat> You say Mark 7 and uh, what else, my brother? Uh, verse 15 to 23. Uh, 15 to 23. All uh, right. Okay, cool. It says, there is nothing from without a man that enter into him can defile him, but the things which come out of him, 
those are they that defile the man. If any, if any man have ears to hear, let him hear. And and when he was entered into the house from the people, his disciples asked him concerning the parable. And he said unto them, Are ye so without understanding also? Do ye not perceive that whatsoever thing from without entereth into the man, it cannot defile him? Because it entereth not into his heart, but mm -hmm. into the belly, and goeth out into the draught, purging all meats. And he said, That which cometh out of the man that defileth the man, from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulterers, fornication, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, mm -hmm. deceit, lavishness, and evil <laughs> eye, blasphemy, pride, and foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. So that kind of goes back into that previous verse, brother. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it does. Uh, it's an echo. Oh, uh, I don't know. Um, Somebody unmuted. Okay, it's it's, it's clean now. Um, yeah, he's basically just reiterating what we just read in Mark 15. And I like this one even better. So I'm glad he did go here. Because it, it really explains what I was saying even more clearly. The topic, the issue is not with a dietary law. It's still talking about your tradition of washing over keeping the law in itself and being hypocrites. So let's bag up in this exact same chapter and let's go to, uh, uh, let's see, verse 6. It says, and he answered and said unto them, well hath Esaias, which is the prophet Isaiah. It's funny he keep going back to the prophets. Prophesy to you hypocrites that it is written, this people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is uh, far from me. So he's saying that the Pharisees, you know what I'm saying? They talked about the law. They talked about the law. But in their heart, they was hypocrites. They wasn't really doing it. So let's keep going. How be it in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. So they was putting the commandments of men over God's law, which is, you know, they had oral traditions and all those type of things. It says, for laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men as the washing of pots and cups and many other such like things you do. And he said unto them, for well, ye reject the commandment of God that ye may keep your own traditions. It says, for Moses said, there you go again. See, I mean, he was literally setting himself up for cuts. For Moses said, honor thy father and thy mother. And whosoever curseth his father or mother, let him die to death. No, Jesus didn't say this. Let's get down to verse 13. Making the word of God of non-effect through your traditions, which ye have delivered, and many such things do ye. So what he's saying is, basically the Pharisees made the commandments of God, which is etched in stone, which Jesus kept him himself, his apostles kept him himself. They made it of non-effect because they went more off oral traditions and commandments of men, traditions, than they did the law itself. It had nothing to do with the dietary law. All right, thanks a lot, Brother Mikael. Okay. That's it, family. <laughs> That's it, family. We're gonna uh, get into the voting now. Uh, who do you vote for? And this is gonna be a tough one right here, I already know. Uh, who do you vote for, Brother Mikael or Brother G. Kai? Let me know. Right. And now, who do you vote for? We're going to start out with the peers' vote, as what we always do here on Solar Reason Debate League. Uh, the number is 215 954 9091. Vote now or forever hold your speech. This is the Solar Vision Debate League, man. Very, 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 I think it's an interesting topic. Mm -hmm. Christopher Harris, Peace Family, who you vote for? I'm gonna go with Mikael. You know, Gcon had his track crews on all night. Jesus never existed. Peace. That's <laughs> Chris is always throwing shots before he hops off the line. Okay, so we got one vote for Mikael.
one peer vote for Mikhail. The peer vote is now in effect, family. Calling Nano Fab hold your speech. I'm pretty sure y'all got a lot to talk about over there on the argument league, man. <laughs> Especially after that last debate. That was a that was an upset, actually. And I just thought about that. Q with the upset win. We gotta talk about that, brother. Shout out to Do the Knowledge Radio for throwing that number inside of the chat room. Let's see. I, I think I thought the text bump. Who the hell is this? Text me at 107 in the morning. Mikael. Out the blue votes for Mikael. So we got two votes for Mikael. All right. The peer vote is down in effect. Vote now to have old your speech, family. This is the Solar Vision Debate League. What's up with the peers? Where my peers at? Where your friends at? Mikhail and Chikan. You ain't got no friends? Y'all ain't got no peers? What's going on? Man, I don't know. I don't know, man. I probably don't want to touch it, man. This is a tough one. I, I say this is a very close one. You know, both of y'all made some very interesting points. And uh, so, you know, leave it to the judges. We always do the dirty work. Somebody, you know, I have to point the finger one way or another at someone. Hello? Yeah. Uh, you got to wait for the people's vote. When I when I call that out, that's when you call in, bro. All right. Peace, family. The peer vote is now in effect. Members of the debate league only. Hey, we'll get this thing another minute or so. Before we move forward, thus far we have two votes for uh, Mikael and zero for G Khan. <laughs> Damn G, like they don't fuck with you. They don't fuck with you, like. <laughs> you know I'll be giving them. I give them that. Work. <laughs> 